So, it's my pleasure to welcome Steve Kleiman of Massachusetts Institute of Technology. See, I thought every now and then someone ought to say the whole thing instead of just MIT. <laughs> He'll speak to us today about equisingularity of germs of isolated singularities. Thank you. Well, I've um, divided the talk up into four segments. In the first, I'll uh, talk about the general goals of equisingularity theory. In the second, I'll talk about the Whitney conditions. Or really, the Whitney-Tom conditions, which are conditions that give us a good notion of equisingularity. The third segment will be about integral dependence. which is an algebraic tool we use to um, study the Whitney conditions. And finally, I'll talk about another algebraic tool, multiplicity, which we use to control integral dependence, and it's here in the theory of multiplicity that we've made some progress over the last year. Okay, so let's uh, talk about equisingularity. The most natural way to study equisingularity is to try to classify singularities into types. But uh, that aspect of the theory doesn't work out very well in general. There there is no satisfactory theory except for the case of plain curves. So we'll talk a little bit about that case. Hi, Terry. So um, the plane in question is the uh, complex two-dimensional space. And we'll work inside with curves, which means the locus of zeros of a, an equation, an analytic function defined in a neighborhood of the origin. So we'll work about the origin in the plane. With um, germs, as they're called. So, for example, we might look at a node. That's the simplest kind of plane singularity, or at a cusp, which we would get by pulling the node out. The theory is fairly old in this case. Newton, for example, in 1676, followed by Guizhou in 1850, who refined Newton's method. found a way of expressing y as a function of x locally at the singular point. But to do that, we have to assume, first of all, that there are no vertical tangents. 
or we change coordinates if need be. And to simplify the discussion, we'll assume there's only one branch. So in the case of the node, we have two branches, two tangent directions at the point. But, uh, <coughs> but we can factor um, the equation of the analytic function f in, into irreducible factors and in that way reduce the issue to the case of a sing of a, <coughs> a function with a single tangent of the curve and then uh, we could consider how the different branches fit together. Well, anyway, Newton uh, gave us an expression for y as a function of x. First of all, we start out with a polynomial. So a 1i x to the i. And then there comes a point where we need a fractional exponent. And for a while, the denominator n1 works out. But then uh, we have to go to a larger denominator. And we can continue with that denominator for a while and then we have to go to yet a larger denominator. So we get a collection of, of pairs known as the characteristic pairs, these initial numbers, mj, nj, a certain finite number of them. And they're called the characteristic pairs. of the singularity. And so they're an analytic variant, invariant of the singularity, a way of defining the equisingularity type. The equisingularity type of our curve is this collection of pairs. Well, <clears throat> around 1930, it was discovered that these pairs have a topological interpretation, rather lovely. So first of all, Browner in 1928, and then Zariski completed his work in 1932. What they did was to look at the germ, take an epsilon ball around the origin and intersect it with our curve and take a look at the boundary. So the boundary of the ball is the three sphere and it contains the boundary of our germ, x epsilon. It turns out that this boundary of that Epsilon is topologically a circle, 
And so we have an embedding of S1, the circle in S3, in other words, a knot. And what these, well, what Brown had discovered was that the type of the knot is given by these characteristic pairs. Uh, since, uh, since about 1900? Not too long. I don't really know. That's an interesting <coughs> issue, historical issue. I, not too long, I'm sure. Uh, right, so what we have here is an iterated Or a snot. Of uh, type MJ MJ. Okay. Well, the the point is that to give this analytic invariant the set of characteristic pairs is equivalent to giving the topological type of the, of the germ as embedded in the plane. So we have a very clean way of defining the equisingularity type as the topological type of the pair. But then, around 1973, it was discovered that, uh, in fact, we don't have simply abstract topological types, but we can put them together in a family. So that uh, we have a locally trivial topological, uh, topologically locally trivial analytic family. Which perhaps is not too surprising because we have all of these uh, curves in the plane, so we just have to find a degree that works for both of them, and we can uh, vary the coefficients of the polynomials. Of yeah, if we have polynomials. Okay. So that's a rather nice theory for plain curves, and it leads to uh, the next approach to equisingularity theory, and that is of stratification. We'd like to stratify a given variety into loci of like singularities, whatever like means, we have to find a good notion. So here's a variety X, and we'll write X as a union, a disjoint union of subsets, some loci, analytic subsets, each of which is smooth. And which fit together nicely 
the sense that if we take the closure of one of the strata and it meets another stratum, then in fact the closure contains that other stratum necessarily in the boundary since it's disjoint. So, how can we divide up our variety into such strata, and what properties should the division have? Well, since it should be analytic, one nice property we would like is that it be stable under hyperplane section, generic hyperplane section. And another nice property is that it should be topologically trivial. Is stable under hyperplane section, generic hyperplane section, yeah. you say it right now, do you mean transverse to strata, or do you mean containing a given strata yeah. that you should right. be able to mean? Well, in a way, both. Yeah, I was just about to say that. For what I know you're heading for, yeah. Okay. Actually, Zariski wanted it to be stable under blow-up as well. He had in mind um, resolution of singularities. It's an old approach, actually, going back to the 19th century. He tried to go up um, by dimension. So if you can resolve a transverse slice, by induction, then you can resolve the product because the singularities are all alike. But that theory never got very far. On the other hand, the local topological triviality led to um, important results notably in the hand of Bob McPherson in uh, two ways. First of all, in 76, he introduced the Euler obstruction, which allowed him to prove the uh, constructible Riemann rock theorem conjectured by Growth and Deacon Deline, and then around 1980, um, he and, and Mark Goreski worked out intersection homology theory, which led to a definitive theory of the Riemann Hilbert correspondence and the solution of the kajdan lustig conjectures. So at that point, there was no doubt that uh, this notion of equisingularity um, from the Whitney conditions that lead to uh, topological triviality was uh, a useful uh, theory. Now in this theory of stratification, we're stratifying the whole variety into loci of like singularities. But there's a tension here between what we did with plane curves and what we're doing here with the the total space. And so there's yet a third approach where the two come together.
where what we stratify is the total space of an analytic family. So just as in the case of plane curves, we look, first of all, for invariance of each of the curves. But then we found that they fit together in a family, which was topologically trivial. The total space was topologically trivial locally. We can try to do something like that in higher dimensions. So I'll put it this way. We want to coin family names. Well, this is a theory, I suppose, was um, begun by Tessier in the 70s. And, and picked up by Terry Gaffney around 1990, well, before and after. So what we want to do here is to find member-wise invariants, what I call family names, names of members of the family, so that if two members have the same name, the same invariant, then when we put them together in an analytic family, the family becomes topologically trivial, or better satisfies some stratification condition, namely the Whitney conditions. So we want member-wise invariance such that when members have the same name, then in any analytic family, they belong to the same stratum. So same name. if and only if same stratum in any analytic family. So it's this last condition uh, view of the theory that uh, we'll discuss from now on. OK, so that's my introduction to equisingularity theory. Let's go on to the Whitney conditions, which are conditions uh, for stratifying the total space. So, okay, we'll work locally at a point on a space X, which will be the total space of a family. So X is in the complex N space, but <coughs> we'll write the n space is a product, Ca cross Cb, and we'll think of the second factor as being the parameter factor. So we'll take coordinates here x1 through xn, but the first x is x1 through xi will be coordinates of, of ca and so forth. And in particular, we'll have an axis of singularities, y. So this will be 0 cross cb. So a typical point 
little y will have uh, the first a coordinates equal to zero, and then uh, we'll have coordinates y1 through yb. Okay. Now, we'll work locally about the origin, and, and there our x will be defined by equations, say p equations. The vanishing of, of p functions. Now, there's a, a funny wrinkle in the theory. There's a question about how to generalize the theory of plane curves. Is it the pair that generalizes the ambient plane together with the curve, or is it the curve itself intrinsically? And I think our experience in the last few years has shown that it's really the pair. So that what we should generalize the plane to is a carrier variety x together with a function which cuts out the uh, variety of of interest, the generalization of the plane curve, so that we'll have a, a z here, which is cut out by one more equation. So one example is uh, the Whitney umbrella, <laughs> which is particularly nice. Uh, wonder if there's enough room here to draw it. There's some colored chalk in that would be helpful. Should be okay. Um, well, you tell me. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to ask Terry to get up and be your guest. Yeah, I was. Harry, I'm told that you have uh, artistic skills, so um, maybe you can improve on this. Uh, we had the uh, node and the cusp. And we can get the cusp by pulling out the node. So we get a family. This is our Whitney umbrella. Now let's see, we want to. Hmm. From that perspective, you're going to have trouble drawing that kind of line that you want to see coming down that kind of conical part. Right, that's what I want to do. Right. So, what do we do here? Well, here's where I need Terry, so. So we want the line here. Something like that. Is that close enough? For the Whitney umbrella, that would be a straight line. That's the more complicated example of laying Tessier with the with kind of a T squared instead of a T. Uh, well, um, more than where I was thinking of a b, an exponent b. So here, um, yeah, so so here x is um, c2 and f is 
x1 squared minus y to the b x2 squared minus x2 cubed. What do I want? Oops, sorry, F is so this is the next one, x2 axis. I hope that's right. <laughs> this is the y axis here. And this is our z. So whatever B is, the members of this family are, are all the same. But the total space depends on B, whether B is 1 or bigger than 1, makes a difference to the um, topology of the family. In fact, to the Whitney conditions. So the pure ambient space X is. Oh, C3. C3. Okay, well. Let's take a hyperplane tangent at the point x here. Right, so uh, <clears throat> we want to think of a, a family here. So we have um, a transverse plane, and um, x, y, and that's uh, The locus where the first A coordinates are allowed to vary, but the final B coordinates are held fixed. So it's x, y that's c2 here. And our z is a plane curve. Which we think of as a level surface of f on x, y. Now, to make everything work, we need some assumptions. So, we want a family of isolated singularities. So, Y will be the axis of singularities. And we would like the other level surfaces, hypersurfaces, of F on X to be non-singular, smooth. Oh, 
Okay. Now, H x here is a hyperplane tangent at x minus y to a level hypersurface of f restricted to x. So there the level hypersurfaces are all smooth. And we look at a hyperplane that contains the tangent space. So that's what we mean by tangent hyperplane. So uh, in your picture, you have hx drawn where little x was actually in f inverse of 0, but that's not in general what you want. That's right. right. Right, and <clears throat> there's a, a distinction there worth making. Uh, if we were going to define Whitney A, then we would take it right there on the uh, on Z. But as Trotman pointed out, that condition Whitney A is going to depend on the. Uh, on this exponent b, which is not the number of variables. <laughs> it's a um, right. <coughs> this exponent beta. Uh, however, the remarkable thing is that if we use the other level hypersurfaces, then we get a theory that's uh, independent of beta. So that's the modification due to Tom of um, Whitney's original conditions. Whitney's conditions came out around 65. And Tom's work um, was published a few years later. So we say, the Whitney, or Tom Whitney AF holds at the origin along Y. Provided the limit of the tangent hyperplane as the point of contact goes to zero. contains the axis y. Well, that's a very nice geometric condition. But it was reformulated as an analytic inequality by Hiranaka. And uh, um, let me write that down because it was that formulation that led further. So Hiranaka first of all in the 69 is the risky volume and then uh, in 76 he studied the condition further, this condition AF and he reformulated it in terms of distance from uh, y to the tangent space at the point x. Right. So it should be some constant times the distance from 
from y to x to some other uh, constant, where the exponent c prime and the multiplier c depend on the path of approach. And then uh, some years later, about 10, well, maybe 8, Henri, <laughs> Nail, and Sabah so, maybe 4, modified this A condition to another condition, which is called WF an analog of Whit Whitney's condition B. And it's obtained here by simply taking the exponent C prime equal to 1. This guy also had this condition for hyperservices earlier in his condition C. Right. Well, it's about, uh, yeah, yeah, in the mid-70s. Okay, so I should mention Tessier, I'll say roughly 75. for hypersurfaces. Okay. And the reason this condition is good is the, well, one important reason is the so-called isotopy theorem of Tom Mather and the and a number of other people who will remain nameless except for Terry Gaffney. Uh, so I guess Mather's work was about 73. Uh, Tom, somewhat earlier, but I guess unpublished. Anyway. <coughs> And they work with the original Whitney conditions, not this modified form WF. But experts such as Terry Gaffney tell me <coughs> that WF implies the existence of a homeomorphism. In other words, the methods used to prove uh, the other form will yield this. It's a matter of lifting vector fields. There's a homeomorphism from a neighborhood of um, x0. Oh, so crosswise. So we're going to trivialize our family. Make it look like a product in such a way that the trivialization trivializes not simply the carrier variety x, but the function f as well. So that's nice. We get the topological triviality that we had for plane curves, and which is useful in, uh, in intersection homology theory and related matters. OK. So now on to integral dependence.
So, of course, we could set up the theory abstractly in, in algebraic terms, but our application is to the case in which the ring O is the ring of the germ of our total space X at the origin. So all the analytic functions defined on a neighborhood. of the origin, the neighborhood depending on the function. And we'll take a free module f of rank p plus 1. p is the number of, of equations defining the carrier x, and then one more for our rf. And a submodule m of f, which will turn out to be the column space of the Jacobian matrix in our application. And, and we'll form the symmetric algebra on F, which is just the polynomial ring in the P plus 1 variables. Uh, take a basis for the free module and use those basis elements as variables and form the polynomial ring with coefficients in our local ring O. And then we have the notion of integral dependence, natural notion. So we say that a polynomial, an element, well, of degree one <coughs> in the polynomial ring, a G and F, is integrally dependent on M if it satisfies an equation of integral dependence, which is a monic polynomial equation of some degree depending on the element. where uh, the combining coefficients are um, homogeneous polynomials of complementary degree. Well, degree i, where r i is the coefficient of, of uh, g to the k minus i. But that coefficient should be in m to the i. So uh, that's the set of uh, sums of powers of i elements of m. So inside the uh, module of all homogeneous uh, polynomials of degree i the elements of F. Well, there are two important criteria for integral dependence. One is the so-called curve criterion. Which is the geometry's analog of uh, the evaluative criterion of the algebraic. So G is integrally dependent on M if and only if for every curve, which is to say an uh, analytic map from the germ of complex line into X, the uh, pullback of our element G, which a priori sits inside of um, the pullback of F alone, in fact, sits inside the pullback of M viewed inside the pullback of 
f. So this has to hold for all gamma, or almost all. The second important criterion is the growth criterion. So G is integrally dependent on M if and only if the magnitude of G of X would put a norm on in most any way is bounded by a constant times the maximum over all points <clears throat> within a distance epsilon of the origin of the length of um, uh, the norm of hi of x where we take generators. Well, a, let's say, of them. Okay, so. In our application to singularity theory, we take M to be the augmented Jacobian module. This is um, Terry's discovery that this is the right module to use. So our module will have A generators. They'll be the columns of the augmented Jacobian matrix. So we take the Fs, which cut out X, F1 through Fp, and we take the gradients and use them as the rows of our Jacobian matrix, the usual Jacobian matrix. So we have P rows, one for each of the p functions defining x, and then one more. We uh, add the gradient of f. We view these derivatives as functions on, um, on x. And so we have a column vector. Well, in fact, we have n column vectors. The first a column columns generate the Jacobian module m. And the remainders are the elements G whose integral dependence on the, uh, on the first H is, is, is what we need to measure. OK. So. I'm about 
ready to state some theorems. Well, first we need one more notion, that of an isis singularity. We say that uh, Cy is a, an isolated, complete intersection singularity, or isis for short. If um, the germ is of pure dimension a minus p minus 1. So we have p plus 1 uh, equations, the f's, the, uh, fi and f, and if each drops the dimension by 1 from from the dimension A of the ambient space, then uh, we say we have an, a complete intersection singularity. And we're assuming it's isolated at the origin. OK. So the basic theorems are due to Terry Gaffney. I will add my name because it, the result appears in a joint paper, but I acted little more than as a scribe. And, uh, and David Massey. Result from last century. What's that? A result from last century. Last, last century. Last Just. Yeah. It is 99, or is it 89? It's 99. <laughs> Just made it. So, um, <clears throat> if AF holds, then the G's, the last columns, are integrally dependent on the Jacobian module. And the converse holds if we have an isis singularity. Well, the direct implication is fairly easy. It's just a matter of using the curve criterion and working everything out, and using Nakayama's lemma at the right point. The uh, converse requires an isis singularity, and there's a lovely geometric argument involving uh, yeah, uh, a lot more depth. Um, we don't really have time to go into it, but I, I mean, I like it a lot. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a matter of dimension counting. Very nice, but it just isn't going to generalize beyond the ISIS case, unfortunately. So we don't know in greater generality whether the uh, dependence of these last columns on the first implies AF. It would be very nice to know.
But the proof will not generalize. However, WF uh, works better. WF holds if and only if the latter columns are um, integrally dependent, not on the Jacobian module, but on the product of the Jacobian module with the ideal of uh, the first coordinates, the coordinates that cut out the origin, times the Jacobian module. The proof here is, is to check the growth criterion. It appears in a paper of, of Terry's and mine, but again, the, the argument was of Terry's. But the nice thing is that we don't need to assume ISIS. So if we can somehow control the integral dependence, then we can get a more general result. And that we can do. We discovered in the last year. So that brings us to the last topic. So multiplicity. There's uh, one more subtlety that we need to discuss hasn't been important yet. <clears throat> so our total space is a germ of, of x at the origin. But that total space is a germ does not have as its fibers, a family of germs. It has a family of multi-germs. The singular locus might separate. So when we leave the origin, it might be that the fiber of our germ has uh, a number of singularities, not just the singularity at the origin. So while we're looking for invariants of the germ at the origin, when we put them together in a family, we have to worry about these other singularities that appear. So as a result, we need to work with multi-germs, or semi-local rings. So OY is a semi-local ring of, of the multi-germ. of the whole singular locus. This is a semi-local ring. And uh, we restrict our free module to the fibers, and also the Jacobian module. Just keep the the Y's fixed. Uh, S now might include, you're calling them singular points, but you're allowing for the fact that they don't 
even occur on where x equals uh, on where uh, f equals zero anymore, right? Little f, they might pop up off the the zero locus of the function little f. Well. I, for, so that's what I'm wondering what you mean by S. So if you take even well, an isolated hypersurface singularity and perturb it, you get some critical points of the function F in the level surface exactly where the relative polar curve would be. So are you counting those as part of S also, these possible critical points of the function when you perturb, or only the ones that occur on the zero locus? Oh. Yeah, we have to include the others. Okay, I thought, I thought that's kind of what you said. Right. All right. Yeah, I mean, algebraically what we do is look at the quotient. Right. For the control that I assume you're going to talk about. Right, right, right. Okay. right. Well, the theory of multiplicities uh, is fairly old. It was made rigorous in the 40s by Vey and um, Chevalier. And then Samuel, in 51, in his thesis, introduced the use of the Hilbert Samuel polynomial and took the normalized leading coefficient. That was that approach was generalized by Buxbaum and Rim in, uh, in 1964, and uh, we get the uh, Buxbaum Rim multiplicity in the case that uh, our submodule is of finite co-length, the finite co-dimension over the complex numbers, finite dimension as a complex vector space, well, the dimension the kth power of the, this free module. So those are the um, homogeneous polynomials and the variables of degree k on, on the fiber. Module of those that are in our submodule generated by the columns of the Jacobian matrix. So this grows as a polynomial in, our, in k. Uh, of degree r, where r is d plus p, and d is the dimension of of our ambient fiber x y. Well. This multiplicity works out well in the case of Isis singularities, as, as we learn through Terry's work. But uh, if we don't have an Isis singularity, we need a generalization of this Buxbaum Rim coefficient, the leading coefficient of the Buxbaum Rim polynomial here. And uh, it's taken some time to find a, a good generalization, but one was found about a year ago by two commutative algebraists, Bent Ulrich and his student, Valadashti. So just about a year ago.
they introduced what they call the epsilon multiplicity, which is the limb soup. So how do we get this leading coefficient? Well, we multiply by r factorial and divide by k to the r, and multiply that by the dimension and, and see what the limit is. We don't have a module of finite dimension here, then we have to use something else. And they found that what worked is what the algebraists call H naught of M. It's the vector space of sections in the quotient, which are supported at the origin, which is to say that some power of, well, not just the origin, but all of us, um, some power of the Jacobson radical annihilates the sections. So M here is the Jacobson radical of our semi-local ring. That's to say the intersection of the maximal ideals. We have one for each of these points. There's a um, little history bef before they work this um, limb soup was considered by Dale Kutowski and uh, some colleagues, some co-authors, collaborators, in the case of, uh, of an ideal. And they found examples where this limb soup is irrational. Well, that's a big problem for us. We can't compute it. <laughs> and uh, Terry has said, well, how about the Pinkham example and ones like it? Can we find out, at least in those cases, whether we have an irrational number or an integer or what? Because these examples are quite far from the kinds of examples that come up in the singularity theory. And it may well be that in our case, we have a rational number. In the ideal case, the study by Dale Kutowski and his colleagues, is there any connection with intersection theory? Um, Yes. <laughs> but it, it's fairly complicated. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not that he writes down the definition in terms of some intersection numbers the way we can for the uh, Buxbaum and multiplicity. Oh, so, yeah. I've been curious if you look at the case of the ideal as a Jacobian ideal for non isolated singularities. Yeah. yeah, no. <coughs> right. Their, their ex examples are more exotic, and then in that case, it's, it doesn't give anything interesting. Well, you're going to tell us why this is the right idea. Well, we can prove the principle of specialization of integral dependence. So um, we have an additivity theorem and a positivity and upper semicontinuity, notably, which lead to the 
the principle of specialization of integral dependence. Well, that's the nicest. So, um, so that principle was uh, introduced by Tessier in 72. He gave it the name. And he likes to call it a principle because it isn't tied into any one definition of multiplicity. All right. Okay, and um, Terry found an suggested we, we should be able to generalize it and prove in a more natural way the results in equisingularity theory that Terry had proved in a more ad hoc fashion. Uh, and so Terry and I have a paper that appeared about 99, I think, uh, in which we prove this theorem. And uh, so in the last year, um, Ulrich, Valadashti, and myself have uh, proved the principle with using the epsilon multiplicity. So, If we have constancy of the epsilon multiplicity, actually, and why does it have to be the Jacobian module, any, any submodule? So notably, we want to apply it to the product of the Jacobian module with the, the ideal generated by the axis, the first day axis. So, uh, right, and then if we have uh, an element which is integrally dependent on M um, generically, over Zariski open set of, of Y. Then we have uh, integral dependence globally. Integrally dependent on uh, the submodule M. So, using Tessier's argument, if we could generalize this result about AF, we would get something. <laughs> but since um, we have it for WF, we have something. <laughs> So, um, so we'll state a theorem of Gaffney's and myself and Uwish and Valadashti. That WF holds when we have constancy of the epsilon multiplicity of the product uh, of the ideal of the variables, first day variables, and the Jacobian module. And we already knew the converse in the ISIS case.
So the biggest uh, question is whether we have constancy of the epsilon multiplicity whenever WF holds. So there's a special argument in the ISIS case that really uses the fact that it's an ISIS. And that, so that argument's not going to generalize. We need a, a new argument. Are some examples where it fails? And, and then we'd like some examples that indicate whether epsilon is going to be a rational number in general or not, not an integer, notably, whether it could be irrational. So it's hard to compute the, the multiplicity, even with a computer. For the books von Rim, we can compute it because it's equal to a length. But uh, we don't know about the epsilon multiplicity. So time will tell. All right, well, thank you. Um, you've gone on pretty long, and I maybe could ask a quick question if you had one. I was going to. I myself was just going to say that, yeah, this would be great if epsilon, I thought it was practically calculable in any effective way, but yeah, it looks, but maybe we can talk about that some more at dinner. You might have a quick question? I have a question and you can tell me if it's quick or not. Well, sorry. Sure. Maybe it's easy and if it's long, don't, we don't have to get into it. But earlier you were saying that just in generalizing a curve, C2, you know, there's this question of whether you generalize it, you know, as an embedded object in some, you know, higher dimensional complex space or intrinsically, and that a lot of the theory worked better when it is, you know, kind of embedded, like there's mm -hmm. as a pair. And I was wondering if you could just like elaborate briefly on why that is. Like, it, it, it seems like we kind of like to do things intrinsically. Uh, that's a lovely question. <laughs> I hope I, I can give a minor. Reason why, where you can see the, the uh, why it's important. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. but take a singular curve in C two. Okay, it, it's singular, even topologically singular. You take a small sphere and you intersect with it, and you get some, you get a knot. If you take that same curve in a, and embed it in C three, it's not a knot anymore. It's not a knot anymore. Yeah. And so you, if you're trying to look at things topologically and see the topological, uh, see the singularity in a topological manner, then it's important where it's embedded. Um, kind of the smaller, the smaller the space you can embed it in, the more. Well, I'm not sure I want to go that far, but I was going to say the more stuff you see from the embedding. I'm not sure I want to say that as a general thing, but it seems true in every case I know. Um, the topological data is, uh, you know, kind of weak, and, um, and just uh, topologically, every every curve without you know, by itself, even a singular curve, is homeomorphic to just a copy of C. The the intrinsic topology of the curve, if it's irreducible, doesn't it does. Topologically, it doesn't know it's singular. It's let, me, let me also say something very simple. Okay, so if we look at a hypersurface with an isolated singularity, the Milner number is a topological invariant. But to see the Milner number, you have to puff up the zero set to get some of those level surfaces nearby that are non singular. Okay. So the level surface, the non singular nearby level surfaces carry more information than you can see just looking at the set itself directly. Yeah. So perhaps that explains the difference between A and AF, what, why A is not a very good right, and A is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there is a competing approach here that uh, maybe you can't go into at any, any great length of time. That is using, and I, using machinery developed by Steve and Anders Thorup using uh, pairs of modules. And those have the advantage that the invariants come from them are more directly tied to 
then geometry, so it's easier to prove necessary theorems. Now, the disadvantage is they are not as, it's not so clear in general how uh, we're going to get this nice result that they depend only on the fibers of the family. Actually, that um, approach is, is virtually the same as this one. The role played by F is, is really secondary. You can replace this F by the, um, the double dual of, of M, which is essentially what, what you do, as we discussed in email. So uh, it's, it's not so far removed from the, uh, the two approaches are, are closer than meet the eye. Um, maybe we really should stop, especially because... Are we meeting both of your wives across the street at any particular time? You may not be meeting <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's, thanks, let's thank Steve again. Yeah. And, uh,